Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Bayfan Balzer. And in case you've never been to book club, basically we discuss a book and you could have read the book or not read the book. I give you sort of my opinions on it, how I took it. I love to hear from you. Uh, if you're familiar with the book and sort of your thoughts and opinions on it, there are a couple things upcoming that I just wanted to mention. So the first is you may have noticed my fabulous earrings. Well, they are one of the many projects from a new class I'm teaching called The Artful Holiday. Um, that class starts August 1st and registration will open on July 1st. I'm going to have a bunch of interviews with some of the different teachers. There are 19 amazing teachers. We've got printmakers and quilters and mixed media artists and collage artists and painters and all sorts of different people so that you really get a wide perspective of kind of projects. I'm kind of loving these giant, super lightweight, sparkly earrings. So they're all different projects. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that Design Bootcamp is now open for registration. So this is if you are serious about your art, you don't have to be a professional, but you have to be somebody who is ready for the next step to go beyond copying, to go into like who you are, what your style is, you know, and really how to generate your own work. And then also how to like understand how artwork is put together. That's really what Design Bootcamp is all about. So that is now open for registration for 2023. And I know um, a bunch of spots are already gone. So I hope that you will check that out. You can find that over on my website. Um, so that's kind of all the stuff that's getting started. If you're here, I'd love it if you'd leave a comment just saying hi, because I always love to hear from people. And of course, I'm going to welcome a new member to uh, Scan and Cut Club, which is what my YouTube channel membership is called, and that's Debbie Street. So welcome, Debbie. Thanks so much for becoming a member. Okay. Uh, and Rennie says, hi from the UK. Nice to see what I'm glad we found a time. I sort of find that this sort of 12 one something works for a number of people in Europe, which is always so nice too. So today we are going to be discussing improv quilting, dancing with the wall by Irene Roderick. Okay. And this is what that book looks like. You can see it here. It's a beautiful book. I have to say it's a big hardcover book. It's not like one of those sort of thin, soft um, books. And the pictures are just lush and lovely. And again, if you're not a quilter, which I think a lot of times people are not quilters, so they think a book called Improv Quilting is not for them. I just want to tell you that you can take a lot away from this book. So I can see that we have people here from all over, from Atlanta, from Alberta, Connecticut, um, I see that Nancy is mentioning that boot camp is a great learning opportunity for all. I'm glad that you thought so, Nancy. Um, and welcome, Sue, and welcome, Ruth. It's so nice to see you all. Okay, so the first thing is sort of what is improv quilting? And that, of course, is where Irene begins when she starts the book, right? And so I think I marked this here. Oh, wow. Everywhere. Phoenix, Texas, Washington State. Nice to see you all. So the biggest thing that she says is improv is not sloppy. Improv is thoughtful and considered spontaneity. Stay relaxed, stay connected, stay alert. Let your creativity direct your process. Don't plan, don't overthink, trust yourself, trust the process. Now, some of these things can be really contradictory when it comes to improv work of any kind. And I'm going to talk a little bit about improv collage, right, with paper, which is essentially the same idea as improv quilting without some of the engineering. So again, I'm going to say this to you. When people talk about intuitive painting or improv quilting or any of that, I think there is kind of this idea that it's like anything goes. But the truth of the matter is exactly what Irene says here, which is improv is thoughtful and considered spontaneity. And so the trick, I think, is, well, we'll talk about it as we go on. I don't, I don't want to give away the end quite yet. I see that we're saying hello from Washington State, from Nova Scotia, from Rochester, New York. Hello to everyone. I'm so glad that you could join me. And if you're watching this on the replay, I'm glad that you're here, too. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is Irene does take you through sort of her journey as a quilter, and you can see sort of where she went to. Now, she does mention a couple people that were influences, and one of the things for me, and you know this if you watch the book club about Mark Harold, is that I absolutely 100% when an artist mentions who influences them, I'm on it. Like, I want to go and see who these people are. So I thought I'd show those to you that you might also be interested in seeing that. 
So let me see if I can get to the next slide. So she mentions Denise Schmidt. Now she spelled Denise with an I and I online could not find a quilter with an I. So I think and I could be wrong, but I think it's this Denise Schmidt with a Y because these quilts seem to be in line with what she's talking about. Um, I really like the quilt that you can see with the ladder because it helps you to understand the scale. And that is one thing overall that I've seen with a lot of the work in this book is that scale really matters. They wouldn't be as impressive if they were tiny. And then, of course, I love these little colored um, stripes that she has here. Another quilter that she mentioned is Gwen Marston. And you can see um, these photos are from a lecture that Gwen Marston gave about her work. And you can see that there uh, is a lot of fun and freedom and just color. And again, she's using that plain fabric, which has somewhat become a hallmark of improv quilting, but it does not have to be. OK, it does not have to be. I think people conflate modern quilting and improv quilting as the same thing. And a lot, not all, of modern quilting involves plain fabric, meaning unpatterned. But it doesn't have to be that way. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And the third quilter that she mentions is the indomitable Nancy Crow. This is from an exhibit um, of work that she had. Those quilts are huge. Um, and I actually attended a two week Nancy Crow workshop before I was ready to go, to be completely honest. So here's some work I did back in 2018 at the Crow Barn with Nancy Crow. You can see the sketch in black and white fabric on the left, then the one where I was working out the values in the middle, and then the one where I brought it into color on the right. And I have to say, I had no idea what the insert the expletive here I was doing. This was way beyond my pay grade at this point. I was mostly confused the entire workshop, but it was, it, I think it's good to challenge yourself. And I think it's actually one of the reasons I went on the journey that started design bootcamp, that started book club, that started so many things is I understood that I was supposed to be doing something and I was supposed to be understanding something, but I didn't know what that something was. Like I, I people would talk about value and I would be like, oh, okay. And I understood that it was like dark to light, but I didn't quite get how that helped your eye or what it needed to do or how it balanced or anything like that. And I thought, you know, can you just like randomly put any color that's the right value and what is the right value? And I just, I didn't know what I was doing is the answer. I probably still don't know what I'm doing and I won't realize that for another five years, but it is one of the reasons that I wanted to grab hold of a lot of design stuff too. Uh, so hi to everybody. I see another Atlanta. We got some Toronto. We got some Michigan, Las Vegas, Venice, Florida coming in from all around. Welcome to you all. Okay, so those are some of her influences. So keeping that in mind, let's take a look back at the book and see if we can't check out some more of the stuff. So she talks a lot about finding your voice. That's what this little thing here says, is finding your voice. And one of the things I wanted to um, read to you is this paragraph right here where she says, start noticing and collecting images that you love. When you are ready to start a new project, look through them and then put them away. They are already in your mind and the ones you need in your piece will emerge as you work. Think of it as a similar phenomenon as dreams with thoughts that reflect your circumstances, fears, joys, and that movie you watched and enjoyed all those years ago. So there are a couple interesting things to me there. So the first is that um, the idea of collecting images is part of your individuality. Now, I know you don't think this is true because it's hard to believe, but your taste is so uniquely you. The things that you like that you may think are universal that everybody likes, they're not. They're truly not. So I did a little experiment on Pinterest for you, and I hope that you'll like it. So let me pull this PowerPoint back up. Um, so I went on Pinterest and I just typed in a search for boards that used improv quilts as the title. And I thought, I'll see what comes up. And like hundreds and hundreds came up, of course. But so here's one person's board. This is someone named Jojo's Haven. And this is what she is, I'm assuming because a she is interested in, in terms of improv quilts, right? Maybe not what I'm interested in, but really interesting to see. Here's another one, totally different. Same title, Karen Condon. This is what she thinks of as improv quilts, lots of lines and stripes and sort of high contrast. 
And then here's another, it's still high contrast, but now we're getting into curves. We're getting into like representational things like leaves, you know, you can even see where she's pinned just some designs, some stained glass, some other stuff, not only just quilts onto her board. That's inspiration for improv quilts. And then just one more here, you can see that this person, Al Kruger, is again pinning this time with pattern fabrics and things that, you know, look on sort of the more traditional side of quilting in some ways. So again, we all have different taste and different ideas about what things are. And that's so important to remember when it comes to your voice. Um, I think sometimes people think your voice is just what comes out of your hands in terms of the art that you make. But it's also like how you filter the world in through yourself. In Design Bootcamp, we call this a you filter. And it's really about like understanding that we can all look at the same thing and have a different take on it based on our own personal experiences, cultural norms around us, you know, whatever it is. And so I think that that is such a key to who you are as an artist. So that time that you're wasting on Pinterest collecting images or whatever, it isn't. It isn't wasted because that's where you're sort of filling yourself up and getting to figure out what you like. I think the important part is organizing it in a way that it's useful to you again. So one of the things I um, talk about a lot is that the only organizational system is one that works for you. So when you're sitting down to work on a new project, are you like, I want to make a quilt, so I want to look at quilt inspiration. Well, then you should collect images, whatever you do it, however if you do it digitally through Pinterest or physically, do you know what I mean, in a notebook, then you should organize it that way. So you have a book of just quilt images or a board of just quilt images. Or are you like, I want to create something that is red and yellow, warm colors. So then you should have a Pinterest board that's about warm colors and you should have all the stuff there. Do you want to do something that's about stripes? Then you need to organize it with stripes. You see what I'm saying here, right? That actually the organization of your thoughts, of your inspiration starts right at the point that you're collecting the information, okay? Um, that's really my take on it. I'm sort of waxing off of what Irene wrote in her book. Okay, so the next part of the book, she takes you through things like supplies and all that kind of stuff that's important, but she really talks about design. And I thought this list on here was super useful and that it might be a list that some people here would like to use to think about things. So here is the list. Is your style figurative or more of an overall pattern? What is the figure ground relationship you most use? What is the scale or size you prefer to work in? Do you like symmetry or asymmetry? Are you most comfy with big, like this is just such a good list of questions. I certainly don't know, need to read them to you. But the point is when you can answer these questions about your work, when you can know your work, when you can understand your work, then you're more likely to make work that you love, right? It makes, it's like 100% makes sense, right? Um, and there's just, again, I love so many, uh, I love Irene's work. I think it's just beautiful. So I just, as a picture book, have enjoyed looking through this. This was kind of fun. I had never thought of this before, but she talks about hidden meanings of color. And I was like, I wonder what she means. And then she put these out. And all of this, the only thing this says is holidays. But as soon as I looked at this, I was like, oh, yeah, red and green are always going to be Christmas. Oh, yeah, orange and black are always going to be Halloween. Oh, yeah, that definitely for me is Valentine's Day. Oh, this is Easter. Now, that may not be true for everyone because we all have different cultural backgrounds, but it is true that color has a lot of personal associations. It isn't, do you know what I mean, sort of just in a vacuum. And the same with shapes. So a good example for that is the quilt that's hanging behind me, this piece. So I intended for these shapes when I made this to be sort of deconstructed ideas of flowers. But I showed the quilt to some people and everybody said things like balloons, spoons. So then I was like, well, I want to push it towards flowers. So I put in some leaf shapes, right? I think there are some um, hidden leaf shapes down here and stuff that you can see to try to, again, push people's um, minds towards garden. But I still got the response from people that they saw. Some people saw people. Spoons was very popular. So again, like you don't know what people are bringing to your work. You only know sort of where you're coming from. And I think that's important to remember. So with color and with everything else. Okay, let's get back into the book. 
Um, so it's a dense book with a lot of great information. It's sort of heavy on the text at the beginning, and then it lightens up into a lot of pictures. But there are two paragraphs here that I marked because I wanted to um, read them to you. I know sometimes like being read a book is not the greatest, but let's try to do this. So it says, I want you to quit thinking, but remain thoughtful. Now that's a thought, isn't it? This process is not about doing shoddy, throw stuff at the wall sort of work. This process is about looking and reacting. This process is about finding out what you can do if you let your subconscious and intuition take the lead. Anyone can take a bunch of scraps and sew them together randomly, but only you can make your quilt. Only you have your experiences, your sense of aesthetics, your way of looking and being in the world. So let's get started. I discovered over the making of many quilts that I use the same kind of elements in all of my work. They are like blocks in traditional quilting, but not square and not all similar or repetitive. I call them components. I think of them as the structures I can rely on to make interesting interactions of color and shapes, including negative space. I didn't create the components to make the quilts. I looked at the quilts I had made and discovered that these were in every quilt. I used them over and over in different ways as the bones or frameworks on which to build. Compared to building a house, every house has walls, doors, windows, and a roof, but there are millions of types of houses. I start with these basic structural components and then add my furnishings to them. You will discover your favorite components. You will design your own shapes and combinations based on your personal aesthetic. So this again, smart, obvious, and something that I think is so true for so many. So I wanted to talk about components. So these are two of my recent pieces, right? And A, I definitely see a color story here where the colors are really similar. But also I notice I'm doing a lot of stripes, right? I can see that there are um, a lot of circles. There's some sort of panels of patterns. So those are some components I use. Well, let's add some more work to look at components. Okay, well, even in this weird vase that I made, I see the circles, I see the texture that I like. And on the one on the left, even though these stripes in the art journal piece are more circular and angled, they're still stripes of a kind, you know, and instead of dots, I've used these floral shapes and, you know, everything here has kind of a botanical feel to me. Let's add some more in. In my sketchbook, I can see that again, I'm using some stripes, I'm using circles, I'm using sort of areas of dark that are splitting up different sections, there's some text. And in the large piece on the right, we're back to stripes and circles. I mean, these are components I'm using over and over again, even though these pieces aren't necessarily related. Even here with the stencil that I created, this is a stencil that I made for maker members, for people who are um, monthly members on my website, which if you want to be a monthly member, that's really easy. You can find it all at um, ballsordesigns.com if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and then here in my collage journal, again, I'm using florals and circles and lines and squares, and I see all of these components coming up and up again. It doesn't mean that all my work looks the same because if I look at these eight pieces, they aren't the same. They aren't the same design. They aren't the same any of that, but they do all feel like the same person made them. And all of this is work that I've done in the last like six months, say. And I can feel it as my work because I am using components, whether intentional or not, over and over. Now, they aren't the quilting components that Irene is using, obviously, but they are still components, right? So I'm just going to um, say that one of the things that we discuss a lot um, in Design Boot Camp is components and working with them and how to figure out what your components are and all that kind of stuff. This little collage that's on the left, I do have a free video on YouTube where you can see how it came together and understand a little bit about design bootcamp. And obviously you can see the quote there, best class. The other thing that I thought was interesting about the components is there's a theory I've subscribed to for a long time called art parts. And I've taught a class about it a few times. Now, obviously Irene's dealing with fabric and I'm dealing with paper and paint, but you can see here stripes, circles, botanical. I'm so boring, right? Even the acemic writing here, like these are all components that I use over and over and over and over again in my work. And so knowing that about myself has really helped me to make work that I like. So even if you are a if you're a card maker or a sewer or whatever it is you are, you can probably find 
some kind of components that you use in your work that would just make it a lot easier for you to like your work at the end once you can kind of break it down and figure out what those are. I mean, even with this quilt, the way that that really came together, let's turn this camera on. Um, the way that that really came together is that I made components. So a lot of them were just strips like this of this wildly patterned fabric that I have hand printed over um, time. You know, some of this is screen printed, some of it's painted, and I just made these components. And then I made them into, I knew I liked stripes. So then I just made them into bigger pieces. And then I just made those into bigger pieces. And sometimes they came together in these weird, you know, other shapes. And you can see how there's almost that shape with the circle and the line here that we're calling a spoon or a balloon or whatever. And if we look back at the piece behind me, and this is just a portion of it, it's giant. Um, you can see all of those things again that I like, like I am a consistent person in terms of what I like. Again, my work doesn't all look the same, but it all has something that looks like me. Sorry, I'm distracted. I'm on the third floor of my house in my studio and uh, a ladder just appeared in front of my skylight. You probably heard it hit the ceiling now. We're having the house painted and it was a surprise to see somebody up this high as if Spider-Man came by for a visit. Okay, so let's get back into the book. Okay, so a big portion of the book now is about how she uses the components. And so I think from here to, I think I marked the end point of it. Did I? Did I maybe mark the end point of it? Yeah. So this is, she's going to teach you the engineering behind making all of the components. So if you're not a quilter, then you can skip from 29 to 72. Okay. Because this is all just how to make these components that she likes. Okay. And you may, even if you are a quilter, want to skip it because they may not be your components. But if you aren't, this is really, really useful instructions on how to put these all together. Then we get into what I thought was so nice, which is she talks about the phases of the process, right? Phase one, I love this. Phase two, I hate this. Phase three, I can't believe I made this. And now I thought I would just show you. So this is a very common thing that people say. I found two different um, memes online. One is this list, right? That says, this is awesome. This is tricky. This is crap. I am crap. And this might be okay. This is awesome. And then of course, a cartoon about it. And I think anybody who's ever made anything, we've all been through this process and get that a hundred percent, right? So I think the thing here that's important to take away besides the giggle is that everybody has those moments where they hate it. But the point over and over is to keep going and not to abandon ship. Keep going. Keep. I always tell my students, I say, keep going until you like it. If you don't like it, it's not done. That's important to remember. So is it done? I don't know. Do you like it? If you like it, then it's probably done. And that's one of the reasons actually why I tell people all the time those first layers should be ugly. You want ugly collage papers. You want ugly things that you're working with because you don't want it to look fabulous right at the beginning. If it looks amazing right at the beginning, like if you think that this is the most beautiful piece of paper in the whole world, which I don't, but if you do, then guess what? This is a finished piece of art. Like frame it. You're done. But if you think it's like not quite right or there's something wrong with it or you're not totally happy with it, then keep going to make it into the art that you want, right? So Donna says, couldn't a collagist learn from the piecing techniques, especially people doing mixed media? Absolutely. And I think thinking about the shapes that she's sharing too, a lot of what she's sharing, I'll just go back for a second, is about the actual sewing together of things because it's a little bit different with seam allowance and stuff like that. So you can see like she's talking about how to lay out your curves, how to pin them together. And you definitely can learn in terms of how to piece them. Luckily, we can glue instead of having to sew. But I absolutely think and agree with you, Donna, that somebody can always, always learn even from a different medium. And that's always important to remember. Right. Uh, just wondering if there is... <laughs> There are so many things I can't do. Um, I actually was had an interview recently with Jane Dunawald, who is one of my um, art people I admire so much. We did her book um, uh, uh, maybe like two months ago, three months ago. I'm trying to remember creative strength training. And one of the things that we were talking about is she said to me, she said, you're a dilettante. 
And before I could get insulted, she said, that's actually the word has been used incorrectly. I am very interested in a lot of things. So I always tell people I have sort of a light knowledge of a lot of things like a puddle, very, very wide, but not that deep. So I'm just always interested. So thanks, Kelly. Uh, okay. So, oh, that's very kind of you, Kelly. I appreciate that. So it actually, I have to tell you lately, I don't know if people are just in a good mood because of the weather or what, but I have had um, some really nice emails to people and it really makes my day and totally changes the way that I like feel about everything. So kind words really matter and I appreciate it. Oh, Gail has some good advice. She says, I have many times when I do not like my work, walk away, put it away. And later I find that it was great. Yes. This happens to me too, because sometimes we're our own worst critics, right? And we get like stuck in our heads about what it's supposed to be or what it should be. And then you look back on it a week later, six weeks later, whatever it is, and you do love it. So I love that. Yes. Walk away. I always tell people, don't cover it up. Don't throw it away. Don't destroy it. Like, wait, 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 wait. It might be great. You don't know. Okay. So the next thing in this book here, let's see. Why can I never get the book to be the big picture? Um, and she has a step-by-step -step guide for how she puts her quilt together. So if you've never seen an improv quilt come together, I find it fascinating. Here is the first piece she started with. Then she built out some more blocks. And she talks the logic about why she did what she did. And you can see it's changing. It's changing. It's changing. We continue on to the next page. Changing, 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 evolving, evolving. And then this is one of my favorite things, which is she shows the same quilt design, but done with pattern fabrics and how much that changes it. It's really, 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 really important. And that's, I think, really great. Um, so Joanne says, there isn't a time I've spent with you online or in person where I haven't been inspired. You are amazing. Thank you, Joanne. I so appreciate that. That's incredibly kind. And Donna suggests that the other thing, even if you don't like it when you come back, is you can actually see the issues when you come back. I like to live with things. And Donna, I couldn't agree more. The older I get, the closer I get to 50, I'll probably say the closer I get to 60, 70 as I age, but the older and older I get, I feel like time has become one of the most important tools in my toolbox. All the way, all the way there with you. Okay. So then there's a ton of stuff about construction in here because obviously with sewing, something like putting these triangles going around becomes really complicated. Like how do you piece them in as opposed to with a collagist where you can very easily just sort of snip, cut and paste. So I kind of skipped over a lot of the construction stuff because it wasn't applying to what I was interested in at the moment. Not to say that I don't quilt, obviously, but for me right now. Also, I just love this quilt and I had to um, show you because I thought it was glorious and gorgeous and wonderful. So these are all made from plain fabrics that she's pieced together into these stripes. And I just thought it was so cool. Okay, just a couple more markers in here. So this is my favorite section of the book. This is worth the price of admission, as they say. This is Irene's journey through quilting, right? So this is her first uh, sort of major piece that she did that it was in this sort of improv style. It's called Primarily Minions, which you can kind of see immediately. I love this piece. I would like to hang this piece in my house. I think it's beautiful. And this just sort of goes on through here. Now, she does mention a couple more artists as we're going through her journey. And this is definitely, if you take it out from the library, if you buy the book, this is the part that is going to be like the yummy eye candy you want. Um, but let me just take you through um, some of the other references that she had. So I'm going to try to pronounce this. She mentioned um, Friedenskreis Hunter. Hundert Wasser. I think that's how you say it. If you're Austrian, please correct me. Um, so he uh, stood out as an opponent of a straight line in any standardization, expressing this concept in the field of building design. So even though he was an artist and he made this kind of art, and you can see no straight lines. He also did it as an artist. So there is a screen print on the left of a piece of artwork over there. And there's actually a building that he designed. And you can see 
you know, all sorts of craziness and not a lot of straight lines, really interesting designs. And he has a number of buildings. So I think that's a kind of cool thing. Um, she mentions Duchamp. One of her uh, titles uh, of her cults, I think, is called Dancing with Duchamp. And so his most famous piece that I know of is this bicycle wheel on a stool. And the story, which I'm not sure if it's apocryphal or not, is Duchamp was asked, like, what is art? And he basically said, like, art is something that's useless, right? You, and so he took two useful things, a bike wheel and a stool, and he made both of them useless. You can't use this for anything. Um, and so then it, it becomes art. And on the right, you can see a painting of his. Um, she also has a quilt named after Calder. And here on the left, you can see a Calder sculpture, outdoor, monumental, gigantic. On the right, you can see one of Calder's many mobiles. I think that's probably what he's known for the best, although he did do paintings as well and another sculpture. And then she mentions the Rothko Chapel in Houston. So here are a couple pictures of it. And these panels, our paintings are so subtle that in different light, they look really different. So this one, which is a New York Times photo that I found online of the Rothko Chapel, um, everything looks kind of like blue and purple. And there's some of them where it looks like straight up purple and no blue. There's some where it looks black. It, I suppose it also depends on the light that's coming through that giant skylight or what it looks like a giant skylight to me in the center, if it's night, if it's day, all that kind of stuff. But I thought those were some interesting influences to share from her. Um, she also mentioned Joe the Quilter Cunningham. And so I found some of his work online too, and you can see it here. And ladies, I just have to say this, the, the most interesting discovery that I had in doing some of the research into her influences is that men have no problem having their photo everywhere. <laughs> with their quilts, with their art. Women sort of always shy away from it. And I'm going to tell you, it's so interesting. It's so much more interesting to see the maker with the works. Put yourself in the photos, stand with your work. It gives a sense of scale and who you are. And I think it's really important. Okay. So moving on, I took a class with Irene actually, and I thought I would show you my progress through her process, which is exactly what she details in the book. So on the left, this is sort of the components that I started with, and then it grew into this, and then I decided that I needed a, another color, so I brought in a sort of darker yellow in the third one on the right. But looking at it, it looked too much like a house. You can see probably a city or a building, as I can. So I just deconstructed the whole thing, took the components apart, and rearranged the components into something new. For instance, you can see this curve on the left, that's the top of the house, became this curve on the bottom that sort of is next to that large blue rectangle. And so the quilt developed over time, binkity, 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 boop, um, and really changed into sort of what it was, trying to go to pure abstraction. And then this is the unquilted, I still haven't quilted it like two years later, but this is the unfinished quilt top of sort of where it is. And I, I think it's a really interesting piece and that her process is really a fun and interesting process. And it all started from this one tiny little component. That's kind of one of the fun things is that you just start with some little things and end up with something huge. And I think that's true of a lot of things of art is it can seem really, really overwhelming and like too much. But when you really start to get into it, it's easier than you think. Okay, so let's finish up with the book and see. So again, so much eye candy in here of all of her beautiful, oh, I love this one. This is the Dancing with Duchamp. Um, so many gorgeous things. These are ones that were inspired by the Rothko Chapel. And you can see those dark indigos and purples, etc. She went through a phase of hand dyeing. And you can see that in there. And she talks about all of this in the book as well. These are the Voltron quilts. Um, and then um, here are some pieces that are sort of her most recent, which I think are, are a real combination of sort of where she's been and where she's going. You can see a lot of uh, the work that she's been doing and a lot of the work that she talks about being interested in. I thought this piece was so stunning. I want to see this in person. I'm sure when it's huge, it's absolutely amazing. And then the last thing that I wanted to point out is she has a great resource guide 
in the back of suggested reading. So if you're here at book club because you love books, then I'm going to guess that this suggested reading is going to be something you're interested in. And she divides it up for improv, for quilting, for color, for design, for inspiration. So I think this is a really great resource guide. And one of the first places that I go in any book that I really like. So that's kind of a look at that improv quilting. Um, I did bring some paper just to hang out for a minute and um, talk about how you can use some of the ideas in this book for whatever it is that you're doing that may not be fabric. Because again, if you always draw inspiration from people who do work like you, your work will always look like theirs. If you can draw inspiration from people who do different things, you know, if you don't do prints, but or, you know, you're not a printmaker and you look at a lot of block print and get inspiration, then your work is going to be more unique than if you're a painter and you only look at paintings. So try to have a really broad base of inspiration. I think that's key. So again, like things I like, I like stripes, I like botanicals, I like writing, right? So these are starting to be my basics. But maybe if I want to make some more interesting, and by the way, this is the kind of collage paper I love. And you may be like, Julie, that is the ugliest piece of paper. And that's great because my, the job of the paper is not to be the star of the show. The job of the paper is to create the design that I want. And so I like that it's really dark, but it has some hints of color. And when I cut it up, it's going to be fabulous. So you can see all of that here. So one of the things that I do sometimes when I have some quote unquote spare time or some TV time or whatever you want to call it, um, is you can start to make some of the things, the components that might be interesting to you. And again, you don't have to be a quilter to make components. So I'm going to start with this as my background. Okay. And this was a jelly print that kind of didn't, um, that I was, I think I was cleaning something off. Right. Um, and so I know that I like circles, so I'm just gonna cut a bunch of circles. And again, like this is when I say like, this is listen to a podcast, watch a YouTube video like you are right now, something that you don't have to pay attention wholly to you know, and you can just start to, so make like, and I can obviously, I could cut more than one at a time, but the thing is I want the circles to be slightly wonky and unique and not completely uniform. But I think you can see what's going to happen is that after, you know, two or three minutes of doing this, I'm going to end up with a really cool paper or component that's going to be a grid of circles. And if I'm feeling ambitious, I can certainly use the leftover outsides, right, that I have here to make another paper, which is going to be a grid of outside circles like that. And I would just glue these down and have a component and then stash them away in my circle file for another day when I'm ready to make some finished art, right? On the other hand, you could get out your gelatin plate and say, I just want to make some circles with a stencil, or I got out a book page and I painted some circles, you know, and then you have this wonderful variety of stuff that you're ready to use, right? So components, art parts, whatever you want to call it. I think that this is a common idea that a lot of artists are using. And again, so you can look at maybe the art, the components or art parts that Irene is using. And although this is fabric and you may love fabric, I love these donut shapes and I can see making a bunch of sort of donut components, right? Or a stamp that's like this. You can also stamp these things. You could stencil them. You could make stencils that are some of these designs you love. Think out of the box. Think of some of the ways that you can take ideas from other disciplines, from other areas, from other people, and just change it up to fit you. So I hope that you enjoyed this. I want to remind you again that registration is open for Design Bootcamp. If you're ready for more, this is the time to sign up and check that out. Put it on your wish list. There is a payment plan. So get in touch with me if you're interested in that. The Artful Holiday class starts August 1st. Make these fabulous earrings and so many more things. Um, if you want to join my Facebook group for people who are students of mine, you can do that. You do have to answer the questions. If you don't answer the questions, uh, you won't be admitted. The Adventures in Arting podcast is back. Woo, woo. We're recording a new episode this week and episodes are coming out every two weeks, which I'm excited about. 
Um, if you want to help this show or me or my channel, if you share with a friend, if you leave a comment, if you give a thumbs up, if you subscribe to my channel, those are all wonderful things that you can do to help me. And I'm so grateful for them uh, when you do them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, the next book club is on August 10th at 1215. And we're going to be discussing this book. It's called the Sketchbook Idea Generator. And it's pretty cool. I'm going to give you a quick peek inside. Um, this might be a book that you would like to have for yourself as opposed to some of these books that are more like library books, but let's, let's just take a quick look and you can see. So the entire idea behind this book is there's a little bit of writing, but this is the heart of the book, which is it's a real mix and match subject, medium and technique and colors. And it's kind of, you just randomly say like, okay, you're going to do everything in your bag in the medium of your choice using these turquoise shades, or you're going to do everything in your bag using crayon and turquoise or with this color thing or with a brush pen or a museum facade. And it just gives you some ideas. So when you're stuck, right, I think that's a fun idea. And the author, um, Jennifer Orkin Lewis is someone who has done a drawing a day for many, many, many years. So I thought it would be a fun book to do because we can uh, all do it and have some very different things come out. So thanks so much. And let's connect on Instagram. I'm Balzer Designs there as well as everywhere else. Bye.